Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Hosanna in the highest. My brothers and sisters, since the beginning of Lent until now, we have prepared our hearts by penance and by charitable works. Today we gather together to herald with the whole church the beginning of the celebration of our Lord's Paschal mystery, that is to say, his passion and his resurrection. For it was to accomplish this mystery that he entered his own city of Jerusalem. Therefore, with all faith, and all devotion. Let us commemorate the Lord's entry into the city for our salvation, following in his footsteps, so that being made by his grace partakers of the cross, we may have a share also in the resurrection and his life. Let us pray. Increase the faith of those who hope in you, O God, and graciously hear the prayers of those who call upon you, that we who today hold high these branches to hail Christ in his triumph may bear fruit for you by good works accomplished in him who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to hear a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus and his disciples drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find an ass tethered and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them here to me. And if anyone should say anything to you, reply, the master has need of them. Then he will send them at once. This happened so that what had been spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Say to daughter Zion, behold, your king comes to you, meek and riding on an ass, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had ordered them. They brought the ass and the colt and laid their cloaks over them, and he sat upon them. The very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and strewed them on the road. The crowds preceding him and those following kept crying out and saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was shaken and asked, Who is this? And the crowds replied, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth, Nazareth in Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Christ. Six days before the Passover, when the Lord came into the city of Jerusalem, the children ran to meet him. In their hands they carried palm branches, and with a loud voice cried out, Hosanna in the highest, blessed are you who have come in your abundant mercy. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who as an example of humility for the human race to follow, caused our Savior to take flesh and submit to the cross. Graciously grant that we may heed his lesson of patient suffering, and so merit a share in his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we hear from God's word. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord God has given me a well-trained tongue, that I might know how to speak to the weary, a word that will rouse them. Morning after morning he opens my ear that I may hear, and I have not rebelled, have not turned back. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who plucked my beard, my face I did not shield from buffets and spitting. The Lord God is my help, therefore I am not disgraced. I have set my face like flint, knowing that I shall not be put to shame. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The responsorial psalm. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? My, my God, God, my God, God, 
why have you abandoned me? All who see me scoff at me. They mock me with parted lips. They wag their heads. He relied on the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he loves him. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Indeed, many dogs surround me. A pack of evildoers closes in upon me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? They divide my garments among them, and from my vesture they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far from me. O my help, hasten to aid me. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, give glory to him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness, and found human in appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to Mark The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were to take place in two days' time, so the chief priests and the scribes were seeking a way to arrest him, be treachery, and put him to death. They said, Not during the festival, for fear that there may be a riot among the people. When he was in Bethany reclining at a table in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of perfumed oil, costly genuine spikenard. She broke the alabaster jar and poured it on his head. There were some who were indignant. Why has there been a waste of this perfumed oil? It could have been sold for more than 300 days' wages and the money given to the poor. They were infuriated with her. Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you make trouble for her? She has done a good thing for me. The poor you will always have with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anticipated anointing my body for burial. Amen, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed to the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests to hand him over to them. When they heard him, they were pleased and promised to pay him money. Then he looked for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, His disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a jar of water. Follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest house, my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples then went off, entered the city, and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and as they reclined at table and were eating, Jesus said, Amen. I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one by one, Surely it is not I. He said to them, One of the twelve, the one who dips with me into the dish. For the Son of Man indeed goes, as it is written of him, But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had never been born. While they were eating, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is the blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. Amen. I say to you, 
I shall not drink again the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Then, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will have your faith shaken, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be dispersed. But after I have been raised up, I shall go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all should have their faith shaken, mine will not be. Then Jesus said to him, Amen. I say to you, this very night before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he vehemently replied, Even though I should have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all spoke similarly. Then they came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be troubled and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and keep watch. He advanced a little and fell to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass by him. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Take this cup away from me, but not what I will, but what you will. When he returned, he found them asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Withdrawing again, he prayed, saying the same thing. Then he returned once more and found them asleep, for they could not keep their eyes open and did not know what to answer him. He returned a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is to be handed over to sinners. Get up. Let us go. See, my betrayer is at hand. Then, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who had come from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. His betrayer had arranged a signal with them, saying, The man I shall kiss is the one. Arrest him and lead him away securely. He came and immediately went over to him and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. At this they laid hands on him and arrested him. One of the bystanders drew his sword, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his ear. Jesus said to them in reply, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to seize me? Day after day I was with you teaching in the temple area, yet you did not arrest me, but that the scriptures may be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. Now a young man followed him wearing nothing but a linen cloth about his body. They seized him, but he left the cloth behind and ran off naked. They led Jesus away to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. Peter followed him at a distance into the high priest's courtyard and was seated with the guards, warming himself at the fire. The chief priest and the entire Sanhedrin kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus in order to put him to death, but they found none. Many gave false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. Some took the stand and testified falsely against him, alleging, We heard, we heard him, him say, saying, I will destroy, destroy this temple, temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another not made with hands. Even so, their testimony did not agree. The high priest rose before the assembly and questioned Jesus, saying, Have you no answer? What are these men testifying against you? But he was silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Then Jesus answered, I am, and you will see the Son of Man, seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. At that the high priest tore his garments and said, What further need have we of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as deserving to die. Some began to spit on him. They blindfolded him and struck him and said to him, Prophesy. And the guards greeted him with blows. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the high priest's maid came along. Seeing Peter warming himself, she looked intently at him and said, you too were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are talking about. So we went out into the outer court. Then the cock crowed. The maid saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. Once again, he denied it. A little later, the bystanders said to Peter once more, Surely you are one of them, for you too are a Galilean. He began to curse and to swear. I do not know this man, and about whom you are talking. And immediately a cock crowed a second time. 
Then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. He broke down and wept. As soon as morning came, the chief priests with the elders and the scribes, that is, the whole Sanhedrin, held a council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate questioned him. Are you the king of Jews? He said to him in reply, You say so. The chief priest accused him of many things. Again, Pilate questioned him. Have you no answer? See how many things they accuse you of. Jesus gave him no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now on the occasion of the feast, he used to release them to them one prisoner whom they requested. A man called Barabbas was then in prison along with the rebels who had committed murder in a rebellion. The crowd came forward and began to ask him to do for them as he was accustomed. Pilate answered, Do you want me to release you to the king of the Jews? For he knew that it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed him over. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate again said to them in reply, Then what do you want me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted again, Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? They only shouted the louder, Crucify, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and after he had Jesus scourged, handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the praetorium, and assembled the whole cohort. They clothed him in purple, and weaving a crown of thorns, placed it on him. They bega began to salute him with, Hail, Hail King of the Jews. Jews, and kept striking his head with a reed and spitting upon him. They knelt before him in homage, and when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and led him out to crucify him. They pressed into service a passerby, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. They brought him to the place of Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. They gave him wine, drugged with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him and divided his garments by casting lots for them to see what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. With him, they crucified crucify two revolutionaries, one on his right and one on his left. Those passing by reviled him, shaking their heads, saying, uh -huh. you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself by coming down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests with the scribes mocked him among themselves and said, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the king of Israel, Come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also kept abusing him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, Look, he is calling Elijah. One of them ran, soaked a sponge with wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see if Elijah comes down to him. Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. The veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing him saw how he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this, is, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of the younger James, and of Joseph, and Salome. These women had followed him when he was in Galilee and ministered to him. There were also many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When it was already evening, since it was the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a distinguished member of the council, who was himself awaiting the kingdom of God, came and courageously went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was amazed that he was already dead. He summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned of it from the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. Having bought a linen cloth, he took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, watched where he was laid.
So I think one of the one of the thoughts that can again occur to us when we hear the passion, when we hear this story, is just um, what a waste uh, that this reality right here is this story, this reality that here's Jesus, who was sent by the Father, and it just leads here. It leads to this place of rejection and betrayal and humiliation and abuse and pain and torture and death, failure. And, and it, it can seem like such a waste, right? And of course, we know there's more to this story. We know that, that, that this, <laughs> we know that this actually did something. I, I, again, let's highlight this. On the surface, the story we just proclaimed, the story we just received, that we just heard, it looks like a waste. But what we see with the eyes of faith is we know that it actually did something. And this is, this is one of those uh, mysteries of faith that if we miss it, we miss everything. This mystery of faith that here is Jesus Christ, not only his life, but his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. Those aren't just facts of history. It is the fact of history that has changed everything. Once again, on the surface, it's senseless. On the surface, it's a waste. On the surface, it does nothing. In fact, that's one of the reasons why Father Walter Chizek, right, the author of He Leadeth Me, been following him for the last six weeks. He was an American priest, a Jesuit missionary to Russia. He suffered in the Soviet gulag, he suffered in solitary confinement. And when he said when he was a kid, he used to hear sermons about the passion. He used to hear sermons about Christ's suffering. And he said he disliked them. He said, it all seemed so vivid and yet so useless. There seemed to be no sense in it. And that could be us. This all seems so vivid. He has a very clear picture of Christ's suffering. But it all seems so useless. There seemed to be no sense in it. And yet, at the same time, we know that what seems senseless, this, this what appears to be mere failure, is the historical moment that changed the world. And so what we do is, as Christians is we hear the story and we say, okay, I believe in that story. Which is true, right? It's, it's I believe that that thing, that, that suffering, and just how remarkable is this, that the suffering wasn't senseless, that the suffering actually was powerful, that the suffering did something. In fact, that his failure was fruitful. That's what we believe. And again, if you're a Christian, you believe that story. But a lot of times, here's what we do. A lot of times we say, okay, I believe that story. So I, I know the story, I believe the story. And we, we miss out on, I don't, know if, I, don't wanna, no, I don't know if I wanna say this is the most important part. We sometimes think the story's done. I mean, here we are, we're just commemorating, right? We're commemorating what Jesus has done for us. We're commemorating um, the fact that he saved the world. We're commemorating the fact that, again, his failure was actually fruitful. We're commemorating the fact that this suffering, this death, this future resurrection, that it did something, but the story isn't over. In fact, the invitation for all Christians is not merely to believe the story and to receive the gift of grace from the story. Our invitation as Christians is to enter the story. This is, this is the, in, the incredible mystery of being a Christian is, yes, Christ's seemingly senseless death and suffering redeemed the world, but it's not over yet. It's not over yet. You and I are invited to enter into the story. Why? Because we've been sent into the world. So what I mean by that is, here, the Father sends his Son into this world. You know what it is to be sent? Uh, the, the term in Greek in the New Testament. One who's sent is called an apostle. So one who's sent on a mission has what they call an apostolate, right? So it's very technical terms, but, but just think about it like this. The Father sent the Son. That means the Son is, in some ways, the Father's apostle. He had an apostolate. He was sent on a mission. Jesus then said, as the Father sent me, so I also send you. So that's why he called them apostles, because they were those who were sent. That apostolate, what did the apostolate look like? Well, for Jesus, the apostolate looked like he taught. It looks like he, he healed. It looks like he did miracles. It was awesome. The apostle, apostolate for the apostles, what did that? Well, they taught, they, they healed, they did miracles. Awesome. But what saved the world? Was it Jesus' healing that saved the world? Was it Jesus' teaching that saved the world? When he sent the apostles out, when they were at their apostolate, did their, was, it, was, it the, was the power of their apostolate in their healing? Was the power of their apostolate in their preaching? What was the power of their apostolate in? The power of their apostolate was in the exact same power that Jesus' power apostolate was in. 
What saved the world? His suffering and death. His resurrection. What blessed the world with the church? Yes, the apostles preaching, but possibly more than anything else, the fact that the apostles entered into the story and that their suffering became sanctifying, that, that their pain became powerful, that their failure was not fruitless. And now we have to understand this again. So here's Father Walter Chizek, who, who he finds himself in, himself in Russia. He's an apostle to Russia, right? He, believed, he said, the only reason I, believe I was in Russia is I believed I was sent by God to Russia. So here's my apostolate. And he asked the question, what was my apostolate? I, he said, I thought it was uh, to bring God to these people and bring them salvation, which, yes, he said, that's it. But how does God want me to do this? It turns out that God wanted Father Walter to do this, not by his amazing success, not by his amazing preaching, not by his amazing healing ministry, but by entering into suffering, by uniting his pain to the cross. Now, here's what Walter, Father Walter said. Because, he, again, he was, he, as a kid even, he didn't like the passion. He didn't like the notion of the crucifixion. And he asked the question, even as an adult, he says, why the passion? He says, why pain and suffering? He goes on, he says, is God so vindictive that he must inflict pain, on, pain and suffering on those who follow him? Because that can be a question we can ask. Here's his son. Is God so vindictive he has to inflict pain and suffering? He goes on to say, the answer lies not in God's will, but in the world in which we live and try to follow his will. He said, Christ's life and suffering were redemptive. His apostolate, remember he's an apostle, he's sent out. His apostolate in the scheme of salvation was to restore the original order and harmony in all creation that had been destroyed by sin. His perfect obedience to the Father's will redeemed man's first and continuing disobedience to that will. We, we know the story, right? The story of the fall. In the fall, what happens? Here's Adam and Eve. Here's the first, our first parents. And they're living in loving relationship with God the Father. What breaks the world? What breaks the world is their disobedience. So it's just because, just in just the way that we all share in Adam's sin, his disobedience, we're all called to share in Christ's obedience and his salvation. So what, what heals the world? What heals the world is not pain. And this is Father Walter discovered this. What heals the world is not suffering. What heals the world is saying, okay, this is God's will for me. And then saying yes to that. He goes on to say, the way we enter the story, not just believe the story that Jesus did this, but the way we enter the story, he says, uh, basically, he says, Christ's redemptive act did not of itself restore all things. It simply made the work of redemption possible. It began our redemption. And he says, just as all men share in the disobedience of Adam, so all men must share in the obedience of Christ to the Father's will. Redemption will only be complete when all men share his, share his obedience. So the world has not been changed overnight. And it's the world in which we seek to follow Christ's example that afflicts us as it afflicted him. We wonder why, as Christians, sometimes life feels not as dramatic as it should. Sometimes we can think like, what am I missing in the Christian life? Uh, sometimes we can think like, no, I believe the whole thing. I've read the Bible. I've studied. I pray. What's missing from my life? Because I, I, I believe that I'm invited not just to believe the story. I believe that I... I've been invited to enter into the story. What's missing? And what is missing is this insight that says your suffering is sanctifying. That your pain, united to Christ's, has power. That we sometimes just think that, no, it's, it's, the, it's the teaching, it's the learning, it's the preaching, it's the healing that that changes the world. That's how we participate in God's salvation of the world. But Jesus has revealed something more powerful to us. He's revealed to us that we are called to enter into the story by uniting our sufferings to Christ. In fact, St. Paul writes about this. I think this so that, what that means is Palm Sunday, this whole Holy Week, this is where we get to enter. All of Lent, I mean, we did Lent, why? Why do we give up suffering Lent? Well, for some self-discipline, sure. Why do we give up suffering Lent? To open our hearts to, to the Lord and to the poor? Yeah, great, all those things. But why do we give things up for Lent? Why do, we, why do we voluntarily embrace suffering as Christians? Because we know that suffering is not senseless. We know that 
When we say yes to God's will in this moment, it has power. When we surrender, we are participating in the salvation of the world. And I would say this, because you've been given an apostolate, right? Jesus was sent. He's an apostle, as an apostolate. And what saved the world? Not preaching, not healing, but suffering. The apostles were given an apostolate. What changed the world, what saved the world? Not just their preaching, not just their healing, but their suffering. Father Walter Chizek, he was an apostle. He had an apostolate. What was that? Where would the, did the apostolate bear fruit? And not just in his teaching, not just in his serving, but in his suffering. And if you are an apostle, the way you and I enter into the story is we allow the Lord to have access to our suffering. So these are the three things. If you're going to be, have an apostolate, there's three A's. I'm going to go through them kind of quickly. Because here's the thing, go back to the Colossians. In the letter to, of St. Paul to the Colossians, he says, I rejoice in my suffering. See, this is what we do. We avoid suffering as much as possible. Father Walter talks about that. He said, I hate pain. I hate suffering. None of us like it. St. Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And I make up in my body what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. So again, if you're an apostle, you have an apostolate. Part of your apostolate, the way you're going to enter into the story, is by allowing your suffering to be salvific. It's by allowing your failure to be fruitful. St. Paul, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my body, I'm making up for what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. Involved. To do this, three A's. The first is, um, I need to accept. We talked about this again and again. We need, we need acceptance. Now, so often, so often, we spend so much energy, so much time, we spend so much of our lives wishing things were different. We spend so much energy saying, I just, I wish things were otherwise. And yet, if we're going to be Christians, if we're going to be, belong to Jesus, the first move we have to have is acceptance. That sense of, like, in fact, if we're going to grow in the spiritual life in any way, shape, or form, radical acceptance of reality is necessary. But not just radical acceptance of reality. The Christian acceptance that this moment and these circumstances are God's will for me. That, that to receive every day and every moment as from God's hands and to be able to, this is the challenge because, because it tests our faith. To be able to say, God, is it true? Is it true that this moment, these circumstances, that, that what I'm going through right now is actually been given to me by your hands? To accept that is the first step. Father Walter says it like this. He says it's tough. He says, no matter how close to God the soul felt, no matter how close I felt to God, how blessed it was by an awareness of his presence on any occasion, the realities of life were always at hand, always demanding recognition. And he said, they're always demanding acceptance. And I had continuously to learn to accept God's will, not as I wish to be, not as, I, not as it might have been, but as it actually was at the moment. And it was the struggle to do this that spiritual power and a greater appreciation as well took place. This first step of acceptance, of saying, okay, God, this is your will for me, leads us to then, okay, now what? But we need to have that first. Again, this has been the, the secret that Father Walter has been revealing to us in order to allow your life to, be, to enter the story. The first step, I need to accept, okay, this is God's will for me. And then the second step is surrender. Now, we've been talking about surrender for the last five weeks, and I've gotten so many people ask me, like, what does, see, surrender seems so, uh, seems so impossible, seems so difficult to surrender. Like, surrender seems like, because we look at surrender, we think it's like quitting, right? So, so okay, I'm going to accept God's will and then just quit. Like, I'm going to accept God's will and then I'm just going to stop trying. This is, we, we get it all wrong. We think that surrender is giving up. Surrender is not giving up. Surrender is giving access. This is the second A. First A is acceptance. The second A is giving God access because that's what we do. We surrender. We're not giving something away. We're not, tr not trying. We're not quitting. We're not giving up. What we're saying is, okay, God, you have access. If this is your moment, if this, if this is your will for me in this moment, this person in front of me, this, this pain in my heart, this, this reality that I'm facing, this sadness even in my soul, if this is your will for me, I surrender. Meaning, I give you access to me in my pain. I give you access to me in my sadness. God, I give you access to my whole heart. Whatever you just cracked open, Lord, you have access to. That's what surrender is. It's not quitting. It's not, it's not passivity. It's this act of trust of, okay, God, I'll, I'll let you examine my heart in this deep way. Not only will I let you see my heart and examine my heart, I will let you have my heart in this way. 
He goes on to say, Mother Walter, he said, day by day, I learned to experience in some measure the power of God that's manifested in the mystery of the passion, that pain and suffering comprise, comprise the sacrifice needed in the passion for saving souls. And a similar sacrifice had to be undertaken by all of those called to the apostolate. This, this surrender is basically saying, God, you, you, you have access. We don't like it. And again, our hero here of, of Lent, Father Walter, did not like it either because what did he say? He said, your tendency will be to avoid as much of it as you can for pain in itself is never pleasant. It's so real, so good. He says, but you can learn to see the role of pain and suffering in relation to God's redemptive plan for the universe and each individual soul. If you want to do that, your attitude must change. That you don't shun it when it come, comes upon you, but you bear it in the measure grace is giving you. You see it as putting on Christ in the truest sense of the word. You know, that phrase, to put on Christ, to become another Christ, even to, to be Christian means to be another Christ. So often we think, like, yes, I want to be another Christ. I want to put on Christ. I'm going to be clothed in Christ. And that means in his righteousness. That means in his glory. That means in his holiness. That means in his goodness. All those things, it does. But it also, for us Christians who are walking through this world, it also means putting on Christ in his passion but with the confidence that it does something. God, this is your will for me. I accept it. And now I surrender my heart to you, meaning I give you access to this pain. I give you access to this sadness. I give you access to this sorrow. I give you access to my heart. And then the third thing is, so often people would think like, well, it seems so passive. You're, just letting, you're like you're letting uh, yourself be blown around like a feather on a wind. The third a is to take action because this is the reality. None of us are called to passivity. Even in, in the life of Christ, even, even in the life of the Christian who's called to enter into the story and to accept God's will and to give him access to our lives. But then what we have to do, what we have to do is take action. Why? Because as Father Walter Chizik said, he said, no man's life or no person's life, no man's suffering is lost from the eyes of God. that no matter how big or how small your suffering is, no matter how known or unknown your life is, no one's is lost from the eyes of God. He goes on to say, for each of us has been created to praise, reverence, and serve God, and by this means to save our souls and help in the salvation of others. So that means taking action. It means saying, God, I accept this as your will, and I give you access to my heart, and now, what do you want me to do with it? This is the, the last question. The last A is the question we ask. God, what do you want me to do with this? Goes on to say, no action, however insignificant, if accepted and performed as from God's hand and in conformity with his will, is anything other than redemptive and a sharing in the great work of salvation begun by Christ's passion. You, re you realize this? No action, no little suffering. You're just a little bit hungry right now. Okay, unite that to Jesus. You, you're lonely right now. Unite that to Jesus. You experience failure right now. Okay, unite that to Jesus. What does he say? No action, however insignificant, if accepted, remember acceptance, and performed as from God's hand, received as from God's hand, in conformity with his will, is anything other than redemptive. That's why St. Paul wrote to the Colossians, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Not because the pain made him happy, but because he knew that that suffering was not senseless. And he knew that his failure was fruitful. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my body, I'm making up for what is lacking in his body for the sake of Christ, Christ's body, the church. Now, here's a big question, the last thing. The question we ask is, what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ? John Paul II wrote a, wrote a document on human suffering. And he asked that question. As St. Paul's writing to the Colossians here, what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ? And John Paul II's answer is very clear, very simple, nothing. There's nothing lacking in the sufferings of Christ. But he goes on to say, but, that you and I might know the joy of being part of the story, I'm paraphrasing, but you and I would know the joy of being part of the story, that we actually get to be part of God's redemption of this world. Jesus Christ, in his mercy and his love for you, has extended to each of us a particle of his cross. So that it's not just your victories that bring about a transformation. It's not just the wins that win over the world. But it's that your suffering is no longer senseless. 
that you're now your failure can be fruitful. That your life, even if it's a hidden life, has power. We know this. We know that pain on its own is just painful. <laughs> that suffering on its own just hurts. We know that on its own, the cross simply crushes. Without Jesus, pain is just pain. But united with Jesus Christ, your cross and my cross has a new power. United with Christ, pain has power. It has the power to transform the world, and that's the conclusion that Father Walter comes to. He, he, he said he looked out at the world, he looked out at Russia, he looked out at all of his suffering, and he realized, he said, oh, this suffering actually will not end here. This suffering is my entering into the story and the sufferings of all the people around him in the gulag, in solitary confinement, throughout the whole country of Russia. He said, our suffering will pave a way for a new future. And this is the invitation. I was talking to a priest this last thing. I was talking to a priest uh, just the other day. And he said, he said, nursing homes need to become the new convents. I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, for centuries in the, in the history of the life of the church, there are monks and nuns who have entered into the convents, into the monasteries. And they have prayed and they have offered up their ordinary daily sufferings. And that, that, that has been the fuel for the conversion of the world. That, that those, those, those hidden monks, those hidden nuns who have these, lived these hidden lives of ordinary suffering, but united to the cross of Jesus Christ, has, has transformed the world. It has been the fuel for the gospel to go out into all corners of the world. But now there are fewer monasteries, now there are fewer convents, and there are more nursing homes. And he said what we need is to allow these nursing homes to become the new convents and the new monasteries. Because if you are listening to this and you're stuck in at home, this is the new convent, this is the new monastery, this is the new opportunity. It's, it's, it's the new moment for all of us to discover what Father Walter discovered. As he said, he said, I looked out, he said, oh my gosh, he said, he said, reflecting on all these truths was consoling. The truth that my pain is powerful, united with Jesus, that my suffering is not senseless when it's united to the cross. He said it was consoling, but it was more than consoling. It opened up to me a whole new vision of Siberia and the pain and suffering that went on around me. This is true about your situation as well. You might find yourself stuck in a bed, unable to get out of bed. To unite that suffering with the sufferings of Jesus Christ literally will save lives. You might experience a great and powerful loneliness in this moment. To unite your loneliness to the loneliness of Jesus Christ has the capacity to transform this world. You might experience a great physical pain, mental pain. You might experience physical illness or mental illness to be able to say, okay, God, I accept this. I, I, this, is, this is your will for me. I am willing to surrender this to you and give you access to it. And now I'm going to take action. And I'm going to unite whatever pain I have to your cross. That's how we enter the story. That's why as Christians, we live a fully Christian life. That doesn't mean everything goes our way. It means that we get to participate in the very salvation of the world. And you and I don't have to wait to start because you've already been sent. You already are an apostolate and you already have, you already, you already are an apostle and you already have an apostolate. And an essential part of your apostolate is the essential part of Christ's apostolate. Take your suffering and bring it to the cross. Take your pain and unite it to Christ. Take your failure and hand it to the Lord to accept every moment as from God's hand, to surrender and give him access to every aspect of your life and to take action, knowing that your suffering is salvific, that your pain does have power, and that your failure is fruitful. And part of that fruit 
is the salvation of the world. I invite you to stand as we profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. Amen. Confident in God's love for us and that he hears all of our prayers, we now approach him with our needs. that all Christians may embrace the joy of this Holy Week with a commitment to repent of past sins and strive for holiness. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That church leaders may proclaim with courage and conviction the gospel of Christ crucified. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That world leaders may reflect the sovereignty of Christ as they work to eliminate unnecessary suffering from their countries. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the crucifixion of Christ for all people may teach us that there is no such thing as a worthless life or a person God does not love. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those preparing to enter the church this Easter may be protected from evil and grow in holiness. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That those who have died may find everlasting joy in the Father's kingdom. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the grace this week to accept God's will, to give God access to each moment, and to share in the sufferings of Christ by taking action, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We continue our prayers by offering our prayer for vocations here in the Diocese of Duluth. Please pray for vocations here locally as well as in your locale as we pray together. Almighty Father, we beg you for an increase in religious vocations and holy marriages in our diocese. Help us to be generous in our response to your call. Choose from our homes those who are needed for your work and strengthen us with the courage to say yes and to follow you. Help us as a diocese, as a parish, as families, to encourage and foster vocations to the priesthood, permanent diaconate, and consecrated life. We commend our prayers to our patroness, Mary, Queen of the Rosary, and ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands, for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Through the passion of your only begotten Son, O Lord, may our reconciliation with you be near at hand, so that, though we do not merit it with our own deeds, yet by this sacrifice made once for all, we may feel already the effects of your mercy. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. 
With them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just. Our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For though innocent, he suffered willingly for sinners and accepted unjust condemnation to save the guilty. His death has washed away our sins and his resurrection has purchased our justification. And so with all the angels, we praise you. As in joyful celebration, we acclaim, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, through your death gave life to the world and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. the mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with this Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all your saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, Daniel, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Toward departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Amen. the Savior's command informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress. 
as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. An act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you in my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Father, if this chalice cannot pass without my drinking it, your will be done. The Gospel of Matthew, chapters 26, verse 42. Let us pray. Nourished with these sacred gifts, we humbly beseech you, O Lord, that just as through the death of your Son you have brought us to hope for what we believe, so by his resurrection you may lead us to where you call, through Christ our Lord. Uh, one quick reminder is that, as you probably know, we offer this Mass uh, for you, um, especially we know that people who are joining us for these Masses online are usually people who are unable to get, get into church on per, uh, in person, and so please know that um, our prayers are with you, and that, um, yeah, you just invited, all of us are invited to unite our sufferings, whatever it is that's keeping you from being in person at Mass, with the sacrifice of the Mass. Um, also, this week, Holy Week, Happy Holy Week, um, we will have the uh, Good Holy Thursday Liturgy, we'll have the Good Friday Liturgy, and Easter Sunday Liturgy upcoming in this week. So just uh, please uh, know that we'll be walking with you over the Triduum and praying for you over the Triduum. We pray together now. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan, and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. I invite you to bow down for the blessing. Look, we pray, O Lord, on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ did not hesitate to be delivered into the hands of the wicked and submit to the agony of the cross, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulce Do, et Spes Nostra Salve. A te clamamus, exules filiae ve, a te suspiramus, gementes et flentes, 
in a clock rima room valle. Heya ergo, advocata nostra, imos tuos, misericorde soculos, ad nos converte. Et Jesu, benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis post hoc exilium ostende. O oh, Clemens, O oh, Pia, O oh,